When I look at just one picture from Simon Stallenhog's Tales from the Loop, I feel like I've watched an entire film. In a single haunting image, a novel's worth of narrative seems to play out just below the surface. If you've ever seen this art before, you've probably experienced this too, even if you didn't know where it was from. Tales from the Loop and its sequel, Things from the Flood, are world-building projects set in an alternate version of Sweden in the 80s and 90s, in which a gigantic particle accelerator buried beneath the fields and suburbs begins to alter reality in unpredictable ways. Yet the story is so much more than a summary can convey. There's a reason why Stallenhog's work has been adapted into an RPG, a board game, and even a live-action TV show. It is a haunting, atmospheric project that swallows you whole, and the more scenes you observe, the more you can piece together the engrossing narrative below the surface. So, for this entry into the archive, I want to dive deep into the hidden lore of Tales from the Loop and investigate why the project has struck a chord with me and so many others. This video will explore the art Stalinhog has released online, but you can purchase the full art book using the links in the description. Now, let's enter the world of Simon Stalinhog and discover the mysteries of Tales from the Loop. The distorted timeline of Tales from the Loop begins with the Loop itself, the largest particle accelerator in the world, built to be so powerful it can warp space-time. Constructed in the 1960s, the Loop's presence can be felt everywhere in the surrounding Swedish countryside, not just in daily vibrations and mysterious anomalies, but also in literal changes to the landscape. While the loop itself is underground, monolithic structures and heaps of scrap metal connected to the facility gradually overtake the region. By the 1980s, the period in which Tales from the Loop is set, the colossal cooling towers of the central reactor are almost always in view, with their green lights casting an eerie glow into the foggy skies. These scenes, while beautiful, also invoke a hard-to-place feeling of anxiety, as the looming structures increasingly overshadow the seemingly oblivious townsfolk. Soon, various advancements begin to seep their way into everyday life. Magnetrine vehicles, crafts that can float thanks to a newly discovered levitating force, become increasingly commonplace in the world of the Loop. In the coming decades, several thousand-ton freighters take to the skies, appearing in the far background of various scenes, their artificial lights like distant stars. The scale echoes the megalithic spaceships from films like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, with their vast landscapes of flickering light. Yet there's a sense of quiet, unmistakable dread mixed in with the nostalgia as these ships cast a shadow over scenes of ordinary lives. Stalinhog seems to be telling us that reality around the facility is changing, with the facility's imperceptible influence leaking into all aspects of society. And magnetrine vehicles aren't the most revolutionary machines. Breakthroughs in artificial nervous systems allow for machines that walk with a balance typically only seen in natural organisms. Factories produce multi-legged machines for all purposes, from forestry to mining to warfare. The region surrounding the loop becomes a hub for unmanned units, with strange machines roaming the woods and backcountry. Like the towers and hoverships, these robots create a distinct feeling of wrongness, for lack of a better word. The land itself feels alien and unwelcoming, a place where the ordinary doesn't belong. While Tales from the Loop takes primary inspiration from 80s media, aesthetically the project also echoes the enigmatic 70s sci-fi film Stalker. Directed by Andrei Tarkovsky, Stalker tells the story of three men who venture across a mysterious restricted site known simply as The Zone. At the epicenter of The Zone, there exists a room that can supposedly grant a person's innermost desires, 
The film is dense, complex, and endlessly interpretable. But one could argue that above all, Stalker is a film about atmosphere. Much like Tales from the Loop, the natural green landscapes of the zone aren't what we typically associate with sci-fi scenery. Yet through wide shots in the subtle presence of industrial debris, the countryside of the zone feels menacing and distorted, but in a way that is difficult to rationalize. While conceptually Tales from the Loop and Stalker diverge in various ways, this concept of familiar landscapes rendered unfamiliar through quiet abnormalities is something central to both works. But all the technology we've seen so far in Tales from the Loop is just the beginning. As the decade wears on, whispers begin to circulate that the facility is attempting to create machines able to feel and reason. Some of these prototypes even manage to escape, while others are disposed of unceremoniously. Androids are machines designed to look particularly human, and many find themselves rusting in forgotten corners of the land just one of many strange objects the loop's operations leave behind. And there are rumors of stranger occurrences. Prehistoric monsters begin to appear in the woods, the results of eddies swirling in space-time. In the wake of cosmic energies, a bridge is created, allowing creatures from the distant past to wander into the present. In one image, a group of theropods roam the countryside near an empty road, while arching structures loom in the background. The feeling of out-of-placeness that these paintings evoke is heightened, as their subjects are out of time as well. These dinosaurs have wonderfully retro-designed sensibilities, mirroring what you might see in the original Jurassic Park films or on old-school dinosaur posters. In another scene, a group of hadrosaurids roam through the snow near the rusting shells of abandoned magnetrine vehicles, confused by this strange new land. While an exciting image, there's also a sense in pieces like these that the loop is changing things forever, that these upsets to the natural order might be too great to be made right again. Notably, children feature prominently in most Tales from the Loop images, and indeed, the entire volume is positioned as the childhood memories of the author's alter ego. A childhood near the facility means these children are exposed to many things beyond their comprehension, which they treat as miraculous. They don't understand how irrevocably the world around them is changing. How could they? I think on some level, Tales from the Loop is a story about the cultural memory of the 80s, in which the sci-fi imagery from that decade assumes literal, physical form. In this regard, it shares a lot of DNA with another 80s-inspired film, Panos Cosmatos' Beyond the Black Rainbow. Released in 2010 but set in 1938, the film focuses on a secluded research facility called the Arborea Institute, which houses all sorts of surreal and unethical experiments. Over the course of the film, the protagonist, a girl with latent psychic abilities imprisoned within the lower levels, slowly becomes more and more aware of the horrors the facility really contains. The psychedelic narrative moves at a deliberately slow, hypnotic pace, with much of the plot coming purely from visual storytelling. The retro imagery feels born from the same primordial soup as Tales from the Loop, with most scenes awash with the fused neon light. Yet while Beyond the Black Rainbow is ultimately a story about the loss of innocence and the destruction of childhood, in Tales from the Loop, the children never wake up to the terrors of the facility. Through the lens of childhood, the miracles of the Loop are just that. Miracles. It's only us, the audience, who are aware of how dysfunctional things really are. As a result, as unnerving as the art book can get, it never veers into a full-on nightmare. Probably because the real nightmares show up in Things from the Flood. Released two years after Tales from the Loop, Things from the Flood is a follow-up art book that takes place in the 1990s after the Loop is supposedly decommissioned. 
but the strange occurrences continue. In Things from the Flood, the children are now teenagers, anguished over the disillusionment that comes with growing up. If the first volume is like a dream, the second is like waking up, and finding the world is much less simple than you realized. Things from the Flood begins with disaster. The titular flood comes without warning, a leak from the innards of the decommissioned loop that floods basements, buries cars, and leaves towns surrounding the facility half-drowned. The immediate effect following the flood is displacement, with the government moving families whose homes were destroyed into more urban areas further away from the decommissioned loop. Here, Stalinhog brings to life a landscape of exceedingly bleak and impersonal office buildings, which have a disquieting, liminal quality. Some of these urban landscapes feature colossal vertical cities, surreal towers consisting of numerous conjoined buildings, the product of a public housing program from decades earlier. One noteworthy element that lurks at the edges of these sequences are nameless mascots, whose overly cheerful and commercialized nature contrasts bitterly with the gloomy and dour landscapes. Their exaggerated smiles reflect the prevailing ethos around the loop that everything is fine, although their expressions seem strained and unsettling in such a grim world. Decaying mascots that continue to smile despite the ruin creeping in around them are a motif present in Stalinhog's art in general, and I think strike a chord with a lot of people. There's something fundamentally mesmerizing about these images, which give the impression of a quiet dystopia. And it's not just mascots that help create this atmosphere. Painted flowers adorn the sides of concrete blocks an apparent attempt to make up for what the material world is lacking. At night, the city itself seems threatening, lit by neon advertisements suspended above the skyline by magnetrine technology. Scenes like this show hyper-commercialism creeping into the world of things from the Flood, exerting an influence as subtle and insidious as the loop itself. Discarded robots also feature heavily in these illustrations rusting away in the back alleys of the city. On the margins of urban areas, a new population emerges. Androids fleeing from demolition sites settle in the outskirts of the forests. These displaced machines are called Vagabonds, and are more advanced than the prototypes of the previous decade, showing an interest in colorful clothing and complex patterns. There's an unmistakable despair and desperation to many of these portraits of vagabonds, a feeling that these are intelligent beings pushed to the outskirts of a society that sees them as nuts and bolts. These are machines capable of the self-expression and individualism we typically associate only with ourselves. Yet according to passages from Things from the Flood, most people think of these machines as a nuisance, or outright fear them. In truth, their fears should be directed elsewhere. A sickness overtakes some of the larger machines, a kind of infection that causes them to roam around like queasy animals. Bizarre, organic-looking growths begin to form on their limbs and joints. Soon, the government is working around the clock, trying to contain these nightmarish rogue machines. The official explanation is that the neural grease that allows their artificial nervous systems to function has mutated, resulting in grim-looking but ultimately harmless growths. But if one reads between the margins, another story emerges. Something from the flood has leaked into the groundwater, which react to inorganic material in disturbing ways. For it's not just large machines that the sickness is affecting. In a striking series of images, we can see how smaller objects made of plastic and metal mutate into semi-organic forms. In some pieces, it seems like something is growing inside the empty husks and spilling out through the cracks, whereas in others, it seems like the objects themselves are melting away into a living mass. There's a real terror to some of these images, but also something morbidly engrossing like the pictures themselves are drawing you in closer, asking you to ponder every disquieting detail. 
The objects chosen are instantly familiar from our commercial reality, and yet they take on entirely new meaning when presented in this context. It's fitting that Things from the Flood, a story about growing up from the childhood shown in Tales from the Loop, seems to take inspiration from much darker forms of media. Aesthetically, this section seems to pay homage to the bodily terror of another 80s sci-fi film, David Cronenberg's Videodrome. Not a work for the faint of heart, the disturbing cult classic follows the CEO of a television station who stumbles upon a broadcast signal showing various criminal acts and begins to lose touch with reality as the world around him seems to become disfigured. As is the case in Stallenhog's work, everyday objects begin to writhe like living organisms, with the inorganic and sanitized taking on the properties of the organic and visceral. To parse the exact meaning from Videodrome's madness would be an impossible undertaking in this time frame, but broadly the film seems to explore concepts of how violence intertwines with entertainment, and how humans can become desensitized to visceral horrors. You can see similar themes of desensitization at play in Things from the Flood, as the public fails to question the source of the mutations, or even be appropriately horrified by them. They've seen it all before. Life near the loop is full of quiet, everyday terrors. But in other images, certain infected machines seem to be evolving. In some of Stallenhog's art from Things from the Flood, we can see almost entirely organic beings menacing the countryside. Even more so than usual, there's an ambiguity to many of these sequences. One thing seems clear, however. These fleshy tendrils and strange growths are growing bolder. In some compositions, they seem more like independent life forms than parasites tied to machines. One of my absolute favorite pieces of art from the Things from the Flood series shows a small car menaced by two massive beings. The piece seems to be related to the machine illness, with the creatures possessing similarly fleshy tentacles. But Stallenhog doesn't reveal the exact story behind these life forms, which is part of what makes the image so engrossing. As is often the case with Things from the Flood, the ambiguity makes the world building all the more intriguing. Just how Tales from the Loop represents childhood with its nostalgic atmosphere and more innocent viewpoint, Things from the Flood is a distinctly teenage work, all the way down to the uncomfortable red pimples. Yet at the same time, the story is more than just melancholy, showing the bright moments in growing up as well as the dark ones. I certainly won't give away the ending to Things from the Flood in this video, but suffice to say the narrative continues to embody the themes Stallenhog established throughout his larger body of work. If you'd like to know more of the specifics of what that entails, you'll have to check out the books for yourself. Tales from the Loop and Things from the Flood are both haunting and hopeful. They tell small, ordinary stories in the margins of massive, world-shaking events. With solitary images and minimal text, Simon Stallenhog conjures a world that feels like looking into the future and the past at the same time. And if you find this world as interesting as I do, you can purchase both art books using the links below to get the full story. And Tales from the Loop and Things from the Flood aren't the only incredible world-building projects Stallenhog has created. The Electric State is a richly detailed and melancholy exploration of a post-apocalyptic United States. And The Labyrinth is a darker and more claustrophobic work of cosmic horror. I've got links to those in the description as well. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.